my dear friends in this lecture i am going to talk about the different sepsis phenotypes and their importance and relevance in our day to day clinical practice we all know that sepsis is not a uniform presentation let us start it with a case with three different patients the first patient patient 1 is a 30 year old male who had a small bowel perforation, had undergone surgery. On the third day, the patient develops fever with hypotension and a raised leukocyte count. On the fifth day, the patient requires high inotropes, goes into oliguria with a rising creatinine. And on the seventh day, the patient into high septic shock with multi-organ failure. Patient 2 is another 25-year-old female who had low-grade fever, headache, and altered sensorium. On third day, the patient had low platelets. The TLC was also high, but not so high as it was in our first patient. On the fifth day, the patient develops jaundice with elevated liver enzymes. And on the seventh day, the patient follows the same course into septic shock with multi-organ dysfunction. Our third patient is a 50-year-old male, post-chemotherapy following CA esophagus, who presents with abdominal pain, vomiting, tachycardia with hypotension. But patient is notably afebrile, but the counts is, are high, the TLC is high, the saturation drops. The patient requires mechanical ventilation on high nanotropes and also proceeds to septic shock. So we can see that these three patients are all progressing to septic shock with multi-organ dysfunction within the same time frame through separate courses. And the presentations are varying in one case to another with change in the biochemical param parameters, which is quite different and distinct. Now, what causes these variations in presentation in the course and outcome. We know that from the studies have shown that patients with sepsis can manifest different clinical traits. And these clinical traits are based upon the phenotypes of the disease. And it is those phenotypes compounded with the genotypes. There are not much of research on the genotypes, but there are plenty of researches on the phenotypes so these phenotypes finally culminates into progression of the disease in, 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 its, in its course, whether it's a downhill course or it's a stable course is determined made mainly by the phenotypes. And most importantly, how and when a patient would respond to the appropriate intervention or the treatment is also dependent largely on these phenotypes. Now, these differences, which are attributed to the differences in phenotypes, are only understood partially from the, in, our, in our present day. And But whatever is known that is, that is equivocal, that is unequivocal in that, that these phenotypes are more dependent on the presentation that is primarily important. That, that is, if the patient has a primary problem with the liver, or if a patient has a primary problem in the heart, the phenotypic expression on sepsis would finally modulate that initial illness in such a way that the further course and the response or susceptibility to treatment will follow in a line. Or in other words, if I have to put it simply, I should say that if a patient has a heart failure and a patient has a liver failure, so a patient with a heart failure who is presenting with, with sepsis due to pneumonia will can be attributed to the course of the illnesses that are precisely linked to the heart failure or heart disease in contrast to a patient with a liver disease who when presents in sepsis due to pneumonia will have more features related to the liver despite following a downhill course. One important thing is also to distinguish between the genotype and the phenotype. And it's all known that phenotype is the set of observable physical traits 
while genotype refers to the genetic information that is coded in the telos in the <clears throat> genes and which identified by the whether homozygous dominant heterozygous or homozygous recessive that is a very broadly there are much more detailed differences in depth distinguishing features between the two but for our working knowledge this is adequate now why it is important to know these phenotypes because one thing is very clear that even without our knowledge of phenotypes, it is known to us very clearly or unhumingly that sepsis outcomes are widely variable. Variable from place, place to place, time to time, situation to situation, circumstances to circumstances. And extreme contrasting mortalities have been observed within the same time period, that is between the 80s to 2010, where the mortalities have varied in, in the largely published studies, multicentric RCTs, between 18% to as high as 80%. And somewhere, if you look into the 65 septic shock trial, RCTs between 2006 and 2018, the mean mortality of the control group has been relatively same in or around 38.6%. But despite that, there has been one very wide mortality in sepsis patients. And this can only be explained by significant heterogeneity. And the heterogeneous group can be separated into these phenotypes and these district pathophysiology which are more pertinent to the individual phenotypes can be understood in a much better way. And of course, their responsiveness, responsiveness to therapies will vary. And all the future trials could use phenotypic assignment to stratify sepsis patients. So that will show and or delineate clearly the differences that these patients might pose in respect to their course and outcome. Sepsis does not progress or manifest similarly in all patients because of this significant heterogeneity which exists inherently between individuals, between the pathophysiological differences that exist on account of these phenotypes and the immunological responses that are generated in response to the pathogen, which is also dependent on the phenotypes. If you look into this study, they were, they were there were five case vignettes of patients with suspected or confirmed infection and organ dysfunction to a sample of practicing intensivists. So they had, they had done a survey and they had found that all the respondents felt strongly or somewhat confidently that in their ability to apply the traditional consensus definitions. But in spite of applying the traditional definitions, the overall inter agreement in sepsis was poor. That is, there was variability where someone said that, yes, this is sepsis. The other person said, no, it is not. When responses were dichotomized into severe sepsis or septic shock versus not severe sepsis or septic shock, or any sepsis category versus no sepsis, the agreement was still poor. So not only in the diagnosis, but also in the stratification, there lacks a uniformity. Initial studies which tried to delineate this sepsis were not so encouraging because those were the times when artificial intelligence was not much in vogue. And also there were other limitations in understanding the pathophysiology of the sepsis. But the first study that was performed and that was well conducted and that tried to establish the link between multi-organ dysfunction, uh, dysfunction phenotyping during sepsis that was performed by Knox et al. in 2015 by using machine learning techniques in 25, 33 patients who were admitted from the emergency department or shifted from the emergency department to the ICU. And he identified four distinct phenotypes or clusters in terms of the phenotypic expressions. The cluster one included patients with shock and elevated creatinine. Cluster two included patients with minimal mods. Cluster three included patients with shock with hypoxemia and altered mental status. And cluster four with patients with hepatic diseases. And it was seen that the mortality varied from 11% to 28%. The maximum mortality was those in cluster three, that is in patients with shock with hypoxemia and altered mental status. Regression analysis also showed that these phenotypic clusters were largely independent of the age, cause of sepsis, obesity, as well as other comorbidities. And the phenotypes different, differed significantly in the association between the clinical outcomes and the predictors. So this outcome pred prediction outcome analysis, if they could be tailored down to these four phenot uh, phenotypes, 
probably were more accurate. More studies followed. There was a study published by Ibrahim et al. in 2020, where he identified four clinically distinct sepsis subpopulations with distinct organ dysfunction patterns with phenotype 1 with liver disease, phenotype 2 with cardiogenic dysfunction with elevated creatinine, phenotype 3 with minimal organ dysfunction, and phenotype 4, cardiogenic dysfunction with hypoxemia and altered mental status. The populations identified were mostly independent of the origins of sepsis, and the 30-day mortality for these clusters also varied. The highest mortality was seen, again, with phenotype 2, that is, patients who had cardiogenic dysfunction with elevated creatinine. In another study by Zhang et al., which was published a little before this study, there were also four phenotypes. The phenotype 1, which was considered the baseline type. The phenotype 2 was characterized by respiratory dysfunction. Phenotype 3 by multi-organ dysfunction syndrome, that is involving primarily the kidney coagulation, liver, and shock. And phenotype 4 with neurological dysfunction. And it was seen that the phenotype 1 was the commonest, uh, but the mortality was highest in the phenotype 3, that is the one with, or with multi-organ dysfunction syndrome. Now, if we see these studies, all of these were conducted in a more or less similar pattern, uh, in, in, in a way where, where a particular definition of sepsis was followed, and the registry was either retrospectively or prospectively information was extracted. But the breakthrough study came when Seymour et al. analyzed retrospectively from a data of 63,858 patients who met the sepsis 3 criteria within six hours of hospital presentation in three different cohorts, and he applied both statistical, machine learning, and simulation tools. So combination of all the three tools, which were, which were separately used for the prior previous studies, were <clears throat> were, were coalesced by this by Sebor et al. And he identified four sepsis subtypes, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. And each of them was distinct in terms of demographics, laboratory values, and organ dysfunction pattern. And each of them correlated with the biomarkers and mortality. So this alpha phenotype had less laboratory abnormalities, required less vasopressor therapy. The beta phenotype had in older patients with chronic comorbidities, including renal impairment. The gamma phenotype had young patients who had massive hyperinflammation, which was also observed during our COVID pandemic. And the delta phenotype where the patients had liver dysfunction and early septic shock. Following that, there were other studies which tried to pick up the individual traits. For example, this Kudo et al., they tried to see the coagulation phenotypes in sepsis and the effects of recombinant human thrombomodulin. So thrombomodulin is a new immunomodulation therapy, but in what situations and under what circumstances it would be most effective to offer a balanced therapy was observed in, by analyzing three multicenter observational studies. And on that basis, Kudo's identified four coagulation marker-derived sepsis phenotypes. The treatment effects of thrombomodulin varied across these sepsis phenotypes. And the study believed that this will facilitate future trials on thrombomodulin in which sepsis phenotype with high FDP and D-diamet dimer can be targeted effectively for treatment. In another study by Zakari, they identified clinical phenotypes in septic patients presenting with hypotension or elevated lactate. So they picked up that particular trait, and they observed that five sepsis phenotypes with distinct biochemical abnormalities can be identified by clinical characteristics alone, and they can provide an opportunity for early clinical action and ability to, and, and prognostication. So this also further uh, studies which, which went forward and tried to pick up individual traits within sepsis. So today, if we compare what Seymour had found on the basis of the four phenotypes that he chose for, and what Kudo et al. had found on the basis of the coagulation phenotypes, then coagulation phenotypes also he found four phenotypes, which he identified as DA, which was the most severe coagulopathy with high FDP and D-dimer levels, DB with his severe sepsis with moderate coagulopathy, followed by moderate sepsis with mild coagulopathy, and mild sepsis without coagulopathy. 
So according to Simmer study, the Delta phenotype had the most coagulation dysfunction and the highest 28-day mortality. And according to Kudo et al., treatment with thrombomodulin was associated with lower 28-day mortality and in hospital mortality only in the cluster D. So how we can see that if the findings from these studies can be combined, like the Seymour et al., if we can extract out the coagulation dysfunction that is from the delta subphenotype and try to correlate with the effect of thrombomodulin, probably it will be more easily, it will be possible to delineate or effectively decide upon the treatment more easily. So why is this knowledge important? As I told before, heterogeneity among sepsis patients and the adoption of one size fits all strategy can be deleterious. And this can lead to widely divergent or even contradictory results. For many years, no new therapies have become available and it's unlikely to be available in the near future, in the immediate future. And so there is a more need towards the personalized approach regarding sepsis care or what we call as the precision medicine. And identification precisely, identification precisely, identifying precisely the clinical characteristics of heterogeneity is only the first step to understand the potential response of the different septic patients to the available therapeutic options. Septic critically ill patients hospitalized in the same ICU may have opposite outcomes despite receiving similar treatment. And our knowledge will help to remove this gap, which will this ignorance by providing us that those insights on the basis of which we can choose therapeutic intervention. Therefore, to conclude, heterogeneity in sepsis is an unsur insurmountable obstacle to deliver appropriate or improved treatment. And the promise of precision medicine comes with a, with a rider that a greater understanding of individual sepsis, clinical expression, disease mechanisms, and heterogeneous treatment response can lead to relocation from poorly characterized disease to personalized medicine or better characterized disease with improved outcomes. Clustering analysis, which is a, which is a means of machine learning, by using advanced mathematical algorithms based on multiple specified variables has been used effectively to quantify the similarity between individuals with sepsis. And that is the stepping stone or that is the pedestal upon which all the future research is based upon, of course, followed by simulation. And we hope someday that we will be able to know the subgroup of septic patients that can benefit from a therapeutic intervention to an even greater detail and also apply the correct timing of that intervention so that we can conquer sepsis in a better way. Thank you very much.